Bowling. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for braving rain. Thank you for braving protesters. Thank you for giving up part of your evening to join us at this latest Playbook Cocktails event. Let's call it the Climate Christmas Cocktails. We're full of seas tonight. And of course, we've got our star guest, Patricia Espinoza uh, from the United Nations, who we'll be hearing from very shortly. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank our partner, Gas Naturally. Without their support, we can't put on great events like this. I want to let you all know that we're filming this event and that there are people watching around the world right now online, a couple of thousand people who will be contributing uh, via the hashtag Playbook Cocktails if you do want to contribute online. Now, during the course of the event, we obviously want to have as much audience participation as possible. So there will be microphones uh, by the side of you in each chair. And we've also got the online system Slido. So if you've got a device with you, you can go to sli.do. And if you enter the password PB Espinoza, you'll be able to ask a question. And Patricia and I will see it on this screen down here. And that'll help us get through as many questions as possible. We've got the two systems going, but it's more efficient if we can use the online system as much as possible. And of course, I know I do this to you every time. I'm going to ask you to fill out a feedback form before you head out. Those two minutes of your feedback will help us do a better event next time. And we can provide more of the people that you're interested in, more of the format that you're interested in, if you make that effort for us. Uh, so before we get into the feature interview tonight, I'd love to invite up onto stage Marco Alvera, who is the first president of Gas Naturally and also the CEO of SNAM. Thank you, Ryan. On uh, uh, behalf of Gas Naturally, we'd like to welcome you all and uh, particular to welcome uh, Mrs. Patricia Spinoza. We're very glad to have you here with us and looking forward to your remarks later. I will keep my introductory remarks brief and leave some room for any questions there may be uh, as I finish. So as Gas Naturally, we represent six member associations uh, to promote uh, uh, the uh, role for natural gas in the energy transition. Uh, we uh, are very focused on what the role of gas should be in helping turn uh, the Paris agreements from words into action and, and really keen to hear uh, what you will have to say about the very important uh, efforts in, in addressing uh, climate change. Uh, in uh, Europe, uh, we believe uh, gas uh, can play a very important role in continuing on the path that was started already. And we've identified four areas where we as uh, industries uh, should focus on and where we would like to bring policymakers uh, attention to. Uh, the first area is uh, the uh, continuation of the reduction of the co use of coal. Uh, this is very different in mature markets and in emerging markets. In mature markets, a lot of progress has been achieved very recently. In recent months, Italy has committed to a complete phase out by 2025, which is a very bold and ambitious target. Uh, the UK has broken the front and really led uh, the charge in this regards. We're waiting for other countries in Europe to take uh, similar and important uh, choices. And I think we're optimistic that this will eventually happen in Europe. It's only a question of time. Um, where coal uh, becomes uh, more of an issue is in emerging markets. It's in those markets where price is uh, important, uh, where uh, energy access is still an issue, and it's about India and China. In these markets, gas will be able to compete with coal only if gas finds a way to become cheaper because energy poverty and economic growth are paramount, even as air quality becomes more important for them. So the first issue is how to become more capable in the emerging markets as a global industry to replace coal. And the answer here is probably to build more storage in these countries to make gas more available. We have seen in China in recent days, notwithstanding a tremendous effort to reduce coal, they are forced to reopen coal because they have lack of access to natural gas, and this is bad for the air quality and bad for global warming. In India, it will be about pricing, and so gas industry has to find ways to reduce the infrastructure costs of liquefaction. The, th the second pillar, which has more to do uh, with Europe and, and again China in India, 
is about strategic storage. We have built, uh, after 1973, very significant strategic petroleum reserves, but very few regions and countries have strategic natural gas reserves. Uh, the tragic accident yesterday in Austria only highlights uh, the requirement and the need for natu natural gas storage, which is intrinsically more fragile than gas, where uh, than oil, where uh, a supply crisis on oil is very hard to envision. There could be a price shock, but it's very hard to envision a situation where we don't have oil. So to move towards strategic gas reserves is both a means of producing that ability to store gas for seasonality purposes, but also to increase security of supply and to lower prices. Uh, countries in Europe, like Italy and France, have a good cover, but countries like China have still a very low uh, cover of storage. The third uh, pillar is to accelerate the use of natural gas in transport. For heavy transport, whether it's ships or trucks, uh, it will happen, there's no question. The economic and environmental benefits of gas over diesel and marine fuel are very strong and significant, and this will contribute to addressing climate change and making the uh, air cleaner. Uh, if we take uh, the latest outlooks from uh, the IEA or from other sources, they still envision a growth in oil used in heavy transport and in vehicles. Uh, we think there's a very good case to be made that natural gas can replace oil in many of these uh, uses. For natural uh, gas cars, uh, they are uh, readily available. In Italy, we have a fleet of one million natural gas vehicles. Uh, they should work in parallel with electric vehicles. We don't know whether the penetration of EVs, which we all support and envision, will be 15, 20, 30 percent in the next 15 years. That still leaves 70, 80, or 90 percent of petrol or diesel cars when a gas car has 95 percent less emissions and 40 percent less CO2 and costs half the price to drive. We think there's a compelling case to be made and we think the industry should work closer together with auto manufacturers and policymakers to really support uh, this growth. The final pillar, which is the most strategic and long-term pillar, is that the gas industry and gas has to worry about its long-term future by becoming greener. The industry has to address methane leakage head-on, uh, define policies and procedures and ways to measure it and to reduce it, uh, and it's the industry's responsibility to do so. The industry has to think and find ways uh, to uh, do CCS, if it wants to have a role uh, in the long, long term. Uh, the industry has to begin to work on hydrogen and other means and um, clean gas and renewable gas and uh, biomethane uh, to really work alongside uh, renewables in the future energy mix. Gas has a huge uh, advantage that it has to offer to all consumers and to all industry, which is the storage advantage. Gas costs less than two or three hundred times uh, than electricity to store. And so this advantage has to be there in the long term. If we turn hydrogen back to methane, it can be stored very cheaply. If we store uh, biomethane or if we store normal methane, we spend uh, very little to store it. And this can be true for seasonal storage and for daily storage. So these, I would say, are, are some opening remarks I would make on the four uh, points of what uh, the gas industry should do. Governments should work together to make these benefits uh, available. And I think some of the energy policies that we're beginning to see in Italy, in the UK, and in other countries are really helpful to, to point the direction. I would stop here. If there's any question on anything we've said, we can take this. Now's your chance, folks. It's a big news day with gas. We've got gas supply issues in Europe. Is there a question for Marco? There we are. It's a big advertisement for Slido here. Stasinopoulos, formerly with the European Commission. Uh, you said that uh, coal is in more, more an issue in emerging economies. Eh? Uh, what about Poland in Europe? For Poland, 
coal is a very important. And my question is, how you see you as a representative of the gas industry? In Poland, it is a matter of competition, comp uh, productivity, or it's a matter of pricing? I think, I think when we deal with coal, we're dealing with a number of issues. We're dealing with uh, costs, we're dealing with security, uh, so countries that have coal feel safer in using their own product than importing product. We're dealing with balance of payments issue, and we're dealing with labor issues. So if a country has its own coal and its own mines and its own coal miners, like we've seen in America very clearly, there's a very strong argument to keep those jobs going. Um, when I look at the global perspective, uh, the impact of coal on the global CO2 emissions is important, but is not nearly as important as the emerging economies. I think Poland will follow suit. When I say Europe, I mean including Poland and Germany. The uh, phasing out of coal is a question of time uh, more than if it will happen. So whether it's 2025, 2030, 2035, it's, it's going to happen, it's bound to happen, and there's enough regulatory instruments in Europe from ETS to EPS to other instruments to really address coal. In China and India, we don't have any of these instruments. And I don't envisage an uh, Indian economy introducing uh, taxation and making their energy more expensive. If anything, they want to make their energy cheaper. Thank you, Marco. Uh, thanks for that address. And I'd like to invite uh, Patricia Espinoza, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework for the Convention on Climate Change, into the stage. Thank you. <laughs> So firstly, welcome and thank you. It's been a big month. You had Bonn and now Paris. It's been a big year. Um, and it's been a tiring year for lots of us. So thank you for giving up your time to come and join us on stage tonight. Um, we may as well start with Paris, let's say. Um, we had people like Commissioner Cagnetta from the EU describe it as an explosion of private sector activity. It's obviously also a political reaction to the maneuvers of President Trump in the United States, so a clever move by President Macron in France to hold that summit. Um, what was your view on what happened over the last 48 hours in Paris? Well, first of all, let me, let me thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you tonight. And uh, Marco, thank you very much for uh, sponsoring also this uh, event. It gives me the opportunity, the possibility of hopefully uh, transmitting to you uh, two big um, impressions that I would uh, have as a takeaway from the Paris summit. On the one hand, yes, as Commissioner Cañete said, um, really an incredible amount of um, um, initiatives of uh, solutions, of uh, creativity in addressing the issue of climate change by leaders from countries, from industry, from uh, civil society, really by leaders from all different uh, areas of our societies. At the same time, also an incredible sense of urgency on the need to address climate change. So uh, these two uh, components were there, I would say, in basically each and every one of the dialogues, the conversations that took place in, in Paris. Um, I think that uh, what we saw in Paris is uh, truly um, a very clear example of um, a transformation of the world that is already Start, has already started. Like the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Guterres, Antonio Guterres said, uh, the train has left the station, so anybody that get, doesn't get on the train will be left behind. So it was um, really very interesting, high quality of dialogues, mm -hmm. very uh, powerful and very um, um, impressive uh, points made by the leaders um, of industry and of the countries. Uh, it was really a very uh, successful meeting. Well, maybe to, to follow up with an extension of that metaphor, if we think all the way back to Copenhagen in 2009, I think it was, the train was, it was basically derailed. 
And when I think of you, I think of you as one of those people who helped put it back on the tracks again in Cancun. Um, and then we got really moving with the, the Paris summit in 2015. Um, but is the train going to get to the destination in time, do you think, to really get to stop the temperature rise, to keep it below 2 degrees, maybe get to 1.5 degrees? That window, or that, I don't know what the metaphor is to mix a train and a window, but it's closing pretty fast. <laughs> so are, are we going to hit the schedule? Yes. Well, uh, look, uh, just now in, at, the, at the conference in Bonn, we had a very interesting report that was uh, presented um, on uh, the 10 must knowns of, of uh, climate change. And one of those uh, 10 must knowns is that we do still have a window of opportunity. It's not very big, it won't last long, but we still have, have one. I would say from uh, the dialogues that we had on the presentation of the report, not more than five years. Mm -hmm. Not more than five years to really see a transformation, to really get into a track that will allow us uh, to still keep on track to, towards achieving the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. So um, we're still, uh, we have resources, we have solutions, I would say that we have the political will. We, we are seeing today, only two years after the Paris Agreement was signed, 170 countries have ratified. Mm -hmm. That's a, a record for a, for a multilateral treaty of this nature. So I would say that all the components are there. And some people forget the US is still in. That's you know, correct. It takes time to get out. People think, oh, President Trump tweeted, they're out. It's not actually true, is it? No, no, no. The Paris Agreement very clearly stated, and it was uh, really carefully uh, crafted in, in, in order to avoid this kind of situation, that any country that would want to withdraw from the Paris Agreement needs to wait three years. Three years as a full member uh, to the agreement. And this is the case of the US. And then, uh, only then, can there be a formal um, notification of the intention to withdraw? And that will, will actually enter into force one year later. So this means the US cannot withdraw until 2020. And um, a, a point I always made, and it was also made by some leaders in the conversations yesterday, is, well, we then have time and we hope that uh, we can uh, get to a point where this decision can be reviewed. Mm -hmm. Now, we covered off Washington, the private sector. One, two other things that really jumped out at me from my scanning of the events in Paris was the role of local government, where you see not just in America, but globally, mayors really sort of picking this up and running with it. And we saw a one planet charter from hundreds of mayors. And then the second point was uh, the spreading of carbon pricing initiatives really across the Americas. It's not just uh, Europe or California thing anymore. You throw in Australia and a couple of uh, cities in China. It's really spreading to a lot of other countries now. Um, is that going fast enough? How, how encouraged or discouraged are you by that dynamics around that? Well, I, I have to say I'm, uh, I'm always encouraged when I see that there is this really, that there, there is determination, there is movement, there is um, a creativity in many ways. Creativity in the financial sector in trying to look at ways uh, that the financial sector can be realigned, that it can be influential in provoking the transformation that we need. Um, I also see uh, get um, uh, encouraged and am optimistic when I see the personal commitment and the enthusiasm that we, uh, that we really get from so many of the uh, actors. Because this, this agenda, the climate change agenda, is an agenda that requires the full participation in each and every sector of society. And this is why, for me, it is very important also to engage in dialogue with absolutely all the actors in the economy, all the actors in, the, in our society, societies at the international level. We cannot afford to not get uh, the conversation going with any one of them. And, um, well, uh, let, me, let me just make a, a reflection on, uh, on the issue of the carbon markets. I think um, this, this was really a, a very, very important and very much welcomed uh, 
announcement, the fact that uh, a carbon market in the Americas is uh, being launched that includes um, countries from the north until the, the far south, including Chile, um, is really a new development. Um, we know that it will take time for that to really uh, move and uh, function fully, but um, what is important is that we see this uh, clear tendency towards the transformation that is needed. Mm -hmm. Well, one area where there might be a risk, but tell me more, you're the expert, uh, we saw at Bonn a kind of a, a re-emergence of some of this differentiation of what countries see as their responsibilities, where Paris saw a bit of a convergence, where both developing and developed countries were saying, OK, we're all, we all have to make reductions. And we saw a little bit of a split in the rhetoric um, in Bonn there um, on the grounds, and, you know, for anyone who's not an expert here, on the grounds that the wealthier countries cause climate change, they're supposed to do most of the fixing of it. Um, and some of the developing countries are pushing back, saying they're not doing enough. Um, how, what's the risk there? Is that really going to unravel and take us back to the sort of 90s? Or are we going to see more of these carbon pricing initiatives and people well, stepping up? I hope that we are going to see more of, of, of these initiatives. And, and by the way, it was um, the carbon market of the Americas and also on the side of the vice premier of China, he also announced that they have now decided to launch the national carbon market in China, which uh, once it is working, it will really be the single market that's the biggest carbon market in the world, just by itself. So it's, it's, um, it's another very important development. But um, uh, let me uh, go back to the negotiations. The climate change negotiations are extremely complex. And um, I would say one point that we need to always bear in mind is that the Paris Agreement and the whole regime on climate change derives from the Convention. And the Convention establishes very clearly that there are um, the developed countries, the ones that have benefited from um, um, development processes without any restrictions on the use of their resources. Uh, and therefore, they have a bigger responsibility in making things, again, uh, great, like uh, President Macron says, in making uh, the planet great again. And um, developing countries, which are still we, uh, addressing lots of challenges in order to um, really being able to fulfill the needs of their populations, and at the same time, facing uh, restrictions on the use of the resources. And therefore, there is this differentiated responsibility, the very famous principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Now, the Paris Agreement was the first time where all countries agreed, yes, we all have a common responsibility, and therefore, all the countries that signed the agreement, which were really all, um, uh, committed to uh, making efforts in order to reduce emissions in their own economies, in their societies. Um, I would say that it doesn't mean, really, that the regime and the principles of the convention are not, no longer valid. So in, in many ways, I would say that we need to find a way of getting a good balance between the regime that is uh, deriving from the Paris Agreement and the general framework, which is the Convention. Because the Paris Agreement somehow is like the daughter and the son of the Convention, right? So it doesn't mean that um, the parents have gone. So they are there. It's part of a whole regime that we need to look at, at uh, in a very comprehensive way. So what we need to achieve now in Poland will be a good package that allows the Paris Agreement to become fully operational, but at the same time, that reflects this more uh, wider framework. Yep. So let's, let's stick, stick on Poland for a moment. That's a really big deal. It's kind of the operating manual of the Paris Agreement. And on one hand, there are people who say, well, Poland's done this before. They've hosted this conference. It's great. They're experienced. On the other hand, especially in a town like Brussels, people freak out and think, whoa, Poland, they're the bad boys of climate. Um, <laughs> is this all going to go wrong? Um, so what are you going to, what steps are you going to take over the next few months to make sure Poland is a success? 
Well, uh, look, yes, Poland is really absolutely uh, uh, crucial. I speak of Poland and the results that we need to deliver as Paris 2.0. It's like Paris was uh, the birth of the, of the Paris Agreement. So we have a framework. Now Poland will be really uh, the pieces uh, and the directives and guidelines in order to make that framework really operate. And um, so, yes, we have a very complex uh, year of negotiations ahead of us. What are we going to do? Well, first, uh, of course, the Secretariat provides um, support uh, for the negotiations on all the different issues. So we need to, we, we need to provide um, really an incredible amount of reports and discussion papers on the different uh, and I guess issues. that's quite technical. There's not so much time to worry about politics if you just have to keep producing and, and following the, the, the it, factory line. It's technical, but at the same time, it has to take care of those political balances. You know, so uh, at the end, what, what makes uh, this task so difficult is getting the technical part uh, done and at the same time, uh, getting a good balance in the overall uh, package. Let me give you an example. As you may know, there is always a discussion whether we are giving enough um, priority to adaptation versus um, mitigation actions, uh, according to the different commitments that countries have undertaken. So we need to, to get a good agreement on how we will measure mitigation activities, how we will be reporting, how countries will be reporting on their mitigation efforts so that we continue to have a good basis that builds trust among the different parties. At the same time, we need to, to talk about adaptation. And so how are countries being able to undertake adaptation activities? What kind of support are they getting, especially talking about developing countries, um, what kind of support are they um, uh, getting in order to build more resilient uh, societies? That's, that's, a, that's a very good example of the, of the kind of um, you know, technical input, but at the same time also political balance. Mm -hmm. So I see some questions coming in on the screen. Before we get to them, I'm going to introduce a Playbook Cocktails tradition to you. Um, and that's where I throw a few uh, rapid fire questions at you. So the goal okay. is to get you to say in sort of one word or one sentence, you know, what your reaction is to, okay. to what I say. Oh. So it's fun. There's nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. Except, <laughs> so. except if, you did, if, you, if you get it wrong. <laughs> then There's you no worry. wrong answers here. So I say Donald Trump. You say... We've got a winner, folks. <laughs> Hope to convince him. <laughs> Excellent. Um, who is your favorite Polish politician? <laughs> well, I guess I have to say the minister that is going to preside over the conference. So oh, that's course. Minister Szyszko. Mm -hmm. um, now, what sort of energy heats your own home? I'm not so... Sure about it, I have to say. I mean, my home in, 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 in Germany. Or, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure. Okay, we'll look But my up. office, I know. Okay, what's that? It's uh, solar. Mm -hmm. yes. Very good, very good. Um, well, maybe not for gas naturally, but it's very good for the solar industry. <laughs> um, I say fracking, you say? Um, in the past. Uh -huh. Um, and now, what do you do personally in your life to, to take control of your carbon emissions and make a difference? Well, first of all, I personally don't have a car. Mm -hmm. um, we have one car. My husband has a car that's hybrid. Mm -hmm. I could not convince him to get a, a, an electrical car, but uh, it's hybrid. I, um, I walk as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I live close to work. That was the choice uh, that good we for made. That, isn't it? that that was yeah. That was the choice we made so that I can walk uh, to the office. Um, I have. Um, I try to have a, a balanced di diet, mm -hmm. uh, also for other reasons, as you mm -hmm. can imagine. But um, yes, uh, 
So this, this kind of things. Great. Um, thank you for that. Now, let's turn to some of these questions here. Uh, we've got a question from Celine uh, Xavier, I think. It's, her name's very small up there, so yes. thank you, Celine. And so the question is about agriculture and land use. So good that we're on the topic of diet. Um, and Celine says that it will probably be one of the most intractable issues within the UN negotiations. So Patricia, what pathways do you see for progress and how can Europe um, make a leap forward on agriculture? Well, on agriculture, I have to say that right now in, at COP23, we got a very important resolution that will now, for the first time in many, many years, allow us to, to start a very serious and detailed conversation on agriculture. Um, and it has to do with the fact that over 90% of the NDCs, the, the National Climate Change Plans, uh, have a content on agriculture. So um, it's, um, it's very challenging, but it's, uh, the framework that was agreed is, OK, let's look at agriculture, but let's uh, look at it in the framework also of the um, uh, SDG regarding uh, zero hunger. Uh, so it's not about um, really um, reducing emissions by r producing uh, less food, by uh, making people hungry. It's uh, let's find solutions in order to address um, emissions, but at the same time also a very important goal for humanity, which is zero hunger. Mm -hmm. And we got, I've got a follow-up question on that there. I was chatting with our energy and our environment reporters before we came here. And I guess the agriculture thing, it connects to land use, it connects to how we protect and use forests and so on. And I mean, as a, just a complete amateur to this, I kept connecting the idea of uh, supporting an energy mix, like should we have uh, a mix around agriculture and land use where we should try and diversify how we use our land, how we, how we produce our food, um, or is that something that is just you put in another basket and you don't consider? No, there is a lot of, of, of work and also of research in, in that area, what is called smart agriculture. Uh, so uh, better ways of, uh, of uh, producing food, more, more efficient, uh, with uh, less use of resources mm -hmm. of all kinds, not only soil, but also water and uh, other kinds of resources. So yes, there is really a lot of uh, solutions out there on how to make agriculture smarter, smarter and at the same time more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is, this, these are uh, the issues that need to, to really come closer to that conversation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in agriculture, we have to bear in mind that it's also uh, an area that has many components, like mm -hmm. any, any uh, economic sector in any econo uh, economy. Um, it has to do also with different realities. You have mm -hmm. the small farmers that are a very specific reality. Mm -hmm. And even when you talk about small farmers, of course, a small farmer in Europe is not the same as a small farmer in Africa or a small farmer in, in Latin America. So it has also a lot of um, a, a local political components, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, that has to be taken into account. So we need to, one of the, of the features of the Paris Agreement, not only regarding agriculture, is the fact that it allows countries to put on the table their, their plans according to their realities. And that means not only economic realities, it means also uh, social and political realities. In many cases, to make a change uh, requires to change the laws, for instance, or to come up with new directives. So that means that uh, you need to engage not only, let's say, the environment ministry uh, or the planning ministry, you also need to uh, engage with the, with the legislators and the finance ministry. The finance People ministry. People always forget the finance ministry. That's the key well, mistake that's, sometimes. That was something very, very important by, uh, that, that came out in the uh, uh, convening of the One Planet Summit mm -hmm. and really trying to put the focus on finance. Mm -hmm. I was um, very encouraged and I made the point there. Uh, we had um, a, an event uh, on the finance day uh, that was held at the Ministry of Finance and the Minister of uh, Environment came together with the Minister of Finance 
And the only one who spoke was mm -hmm. the Minister of Environment. Okay. So I said, you know, this is the, the perfect example of how um, these two ministries should be working everywhere in the world. Great. Now we have another question. Oh, new one's come up. This is from Trina Banerjee. And Trina asks, does the UN have any tentative steps to take in order to help developing countries adapt to technologies that will prevent carbon emissions? Yes. Um, the Convention and the Paris Agreement also foresee a whole um, structure, a whole set of mechanisms in order to provide to developing countries uh, support on finance, technology transfer, and capacity building. So um, the UN, uh, under this regime, um, we have a um, technology mechanism that um, has been functioning uh, not at the level that uh, it should be done, but I'm really hopeful that now that we are coming to the uh, phase of implementing the Paris Agreement, because we have to remember it was only two years ago um, that the Paris Agreement was signed. So uh, a lot of the work of our secretariat was concentrated in getting that agreement. Um, now we have the agreement. It has entered into force. We are hopeful that we will get all the guidelines and rules that will govern the functioning of the agreement by the end of this year. So it's time to concentrate now on implementation. At the same time, the Secretariat, the Climate Change Secretariat, we don't have a mandate to go to countries and uh, directly implement programs. However, the UN does. The UN has really a whole set of entities that are making uh, projects on the ground. So as I see our role coming into the, uh, into the future is really facilitating the uh, contacts and work together, the cooperation between all those entities. Mm -hmm. By the way, not only by the U uh, UN entities, other entities as well, and private sector with the needs that match the needs of the countries uh, worldwide. Now, we've got one, I think, rather sensitive question, but it's a, it's a good one, nevertheless, um, and it's anonymous. So they, they, they didn't put their name to it, and we might find out why in a second. Um, and the question is, at some point, demographics in emerging economies, um, should they be addressed, or is that a taboo subject? So I think that person is asking, we've got very high birth rates in some parts of the world. Eventually, do we actually have too many people to manage our climate? Well, look. Um, if there, if there is a need to address this conversation, of course, it will not be under the, the framework of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, although it is true, no? so many people, uh, some people are saying, for instance, um, the best way to address climate change is to invest in women, in women's education. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why they uh, say so is because um, the higher the level of education of women, uh, the less, um, uh, the lower the rates uh, of, um, of birth mm -hmm. uh, you find. So I think um, uh, the UN is guided by the basic right of every person to take its decisions on how to develop its mm -hmm. potential. And probably what matters most is the output. You know, if one person in a very rich country is producing five times what More, people in right. the poorer countries, I mean, I don't see why those people in the poorer countries shouldn't exist when there is a, an output question, not just a numbers question. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a question of rights. You can, you can then, uh, of course, um, uh, address different aspects of uh, development policies that are linked to, to population. Uh, but um, I, I don't think there is any way that you could um, limit the right of every person, or that you, mm -hmm. according to the UN and the basic human rights, mm -hmm. you could never uh, limit the right of every person to decide uh, to have children or not. Now, I've got a topic that was exciting to me when I first came across it. And that's this idea that maybe in renewable energy, we're now heading towards a Moore's Law situation. So that law in technology where the, 
the capacity and the speed of the microchips doubles every 18 months or so. And the idea in renewable energy is that we're doubling every five years or so. It might even be less than that now. Um, have you come across that idea? Are you excited by it? Does it mean we're really going to finally get to scale in, in the renewable sector? Well, I think we have been seeing in the last uh, two years an, an in incredible expansion of, uh, of renewables. The way that the prices have gone down is just really amazing. In my own country, Mexico, this was mentioned uh, a couple of times um, at the summit yesterday, um, the cheapest uh, energy has just been uh, um, uh, how do you say uh, assigned mm -hmm. uh, at uh, auction yep. has been just auction. So uh, we are seeing that transformation, and um, we are seeing also um, the expansion of the use of the different um, um, uh, sources of energy in in an incredible way. I was talking to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, an incredible lady, and she was uh, telling me about their uh, solar roof uh, um, uh, program in Bangladesh and how it has provided an access to energy to so many uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Now, in spite of all of that, we're not yet there. We're still very far from where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Now, might be time to bring in but everyone yes, in the I am, room. I am excited. Good. Yes. Excellent. I'm excited okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the gentleman on the left there and then Marco uh, at the front. Uh, yes. Please, sir. Thank you. Cédric Demise from Lafarge Hall Sims, a mini concrete company. Um, I've got a question on carbon pricing. And the, the central issue around carbon pricing is the necessity to ensure a level playing field between regions and or between countries. Um, and, and one of the moves that can happen is a, a change in the design of carbon pricing in the way we need today. But that will take time. And trade is often referred as a barrier to remove in the design, to move the design of carbon pricing. So um, that suggests that we need a better alignment between the climate and the trade agenda. And the question is, how are you working with WTO to advance on this issue? Thank you. Well, um, you know, to be very frank, we are not, um, I mean, there has been a, a kind of a red line in the negotiations in linking um, addressing climate change with trade. And uh, this has to do with the uh, uh, fear of um, getting to a situation where um, environmental and climate change considerations uh, could become um, a kind of um, a barrier uh, for trade. Uh, so we are not doing that. However, at the same time, we are addressing this issue in, um, in talking about and encouraging um, the uh, integration of value chains that are sustainable and that are aligned towards the Paris Agreement goals. And there are some examples of some companies that are, are doing it, very interesting examples. Um, but I, I fully concur with you. I mean, we are still on, on carbon pricing. We are still looking at um, separate uh, exercises, not an integrated global exercise. Some of them have not been uh, successful. I think we are still in the, in the learning um, uh, phase. Uh, but we do have lots of extremely successful examples. So I'm encouraged again. I'm a enthusiastic, and I think I, I remain positive and optimistic. Marco, you took a question. We'll let you have another one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. This was excellent, and best of luck with Paris 2.0 in Poland. We need it, and we really wish you all the success. As, as a gas industry, we genuinely feel uh, when we look deep inside our souls that, that we can bring a very positive contribution to the transition uh, that's taking place and that has to take place. Sometimes we are a little perplexed uh, to see that we are seen as part of the problem more than part of the solution, even in, in the near term. So my questions to you are really, 
what one, role one it's it's the same question it's what role <laughs> what role you see for us as a gas industry in in uh, in the decarbonization effort and how we can make our narrative more fitting to that role whatever it is well look um i think in in our process there is a very broad common understanding that the world has to shift away from fossil fuels altogether um, and go into renewables. And there are some cases now that show that um, some renewables in some places in the world, because that's, that's also a, a reality, it's not valid for everywhere, in some places in the world are really highly competitive with some uh, fossil uh, sources of energy. Um, having said that, I think that, and I have, I have made this point uh, many times, I think that we need to make a very serious and objective and um, sound uh, conversation on the role of fossil fuels in the transition towards a carbon neutral world. And I think this is a conversation that has not taken place yet. Um, I, uh, I have been encouraged, I have been able to engage with, uh, for instance, with the Secretary General of OPEC, uh, with many of the leaders uh, of uh, big um, oil and gas producing countries. And um, I think uh, it is in the interest of uh, everyone to engage in this kind of dialogue and to make a very, a, a very, uh, as, as specific as possible uh, um, uh, um, conversation. Because the realities are so different from country to country, even within countries in the different regions, they are so different. So we need to be much more specific about the solutions, about the possibilities, the options available, and the reason why uh, some policies should, be, uh, should, should have a priority over others. In my mind, it is clear that in many cases, gas um, has been and will be uh, one of the uh, sources of energy in this transition. Um, so uh, I believe that, um, you know, as um, Governor Brown was saying recently in, um, in a meeting, um, and you know California is one of the real fund runners in, in this area, he was saying, well, there is no magic wand. We cannot change the reality from that one day to the other. We need to be serious about this and we need to be objective. And uh, at the same time, we should not hesitate in recognizing what the direction of our, our uh, steps should be. If we, if we think a bit longer term, should Marco be planning for a job out of gas before he retires? <laughs> should, uh, should, there, should there be a diversification there, or is, can he well, stick it out with gas for the next 15, well, 20 think, years? Well, I think, um, I think uh, Marco, you could also propose some additional uh, area of business in, in renewables uh, in, in other areas, you know? I think the, that's the other point. The, this agenda provides enormous opportunities for new areas of jobs, for new, um, uh, really new and better jobs, I would say, for um, creative people, for um, really uh, imagining a, a, completely, a completely different world. Mm -hmm. So I, what I would do, I mean, I don't think I have personally a problem because of my age, so <laughs> I, that, that uh, problem I won't have. But yes, for instance, I have a, a son who is a young architect. He is clearly going into sustainable architecture. Into, uh, that's, that's the future, it's very clear. It has to go in that direction. Now, one other thing you mentioned was about being specific. Um, and if I'm recalling correctly, I think there's a report in the works of what it would take to get to, to limit temperature rises to 1.5 degrees. Um, 
Have I remembered that correctly? And, and how is that report going as you prepare for the Poland COP conference next oh, year? Well, you mean the IPCC report or the... It, it's, uh, it could be the next one or it could be um, specific technical work on 1.5 degrees. Yes, think, and then, yeah. uh, then it's the IPCC. Well, this is the international panel uh, on, on climate change, the one that has made really um, all the studies and that gives the scientific basis to the process. They will be presenting this report in, um, uh, before the COP probably in September, and um, they don't disclose too much of, of, of what is going to, to be coming out of, of that report, but uh, um, we do know that um, it will clearly say that we are still far away from achieving that goal. Mm -hmm. If we think that uh, this year already we have um, um, one degree, uh, we have already a recent temperature, recently, one degree, know. so it means we're really very, very far away. But uh, what is encouraging is that we have uh, lots of solutions. I was encouraged definitely but by the summit yesterday in Paris about the different uh, ways of really realigning mm -hmm. and uh, influencing the financial community in order to make this transformation. Mm -hmm. And as we know, finance, the money drives a lot of those transformations. So I'm really hopeful, um, creativity, technologies, solutions, dedication, enthusiasm is there. So I'm hopeful it will. Now, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I wanted to ask you a question as an Australian to a Mexican about Europe. So um, as a, a bit of an outsider <laughs> here, and, and I used to work on climate change in Australia like, yes, a long time ago now, 10 years ago Prime now. Prime Minister. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and we used to think of Europe as being a little bit complacent and arrogant about its efforts to, to reduce the impact of climate change. So Europe's very loud, and it does have some very clear frameworks for, for change, but also it's not really growing as a population compared to some other parts of the world. Um, is Europe a little bit too complacent about what it's doing, or do you have any positive lessons that you want to share from outside Europe to say, hang on, don't think you're holding all of the moral high ground here? Well, I think that uh, it's true that Europe, uh, especially if you look at, at uh, the uh, 21 years that uh, took until we got to the Paris Agreement, yes, in many phases of those negotiations, Europe played a very critical role as a front runner in order to really drive the agenda. Uh, now we have the Paris Agreement, in, and we know uh, today that we need to dramatically increase our ambition for 2020. I think Europe is uh, doing a lot. It's also doing a lot in terms of cooperation. I can tell you, for instance, we are, we, our secretariat is, uh, has its venue in, in Bonn, and we have in the German government really just an amazing partner. The support that we uh, receive from them is, is just uh, exemplary. At the same time, yes, if we need a, really to, if we, if we are to get to where we need, Europe needs to really scale up and deliver much more than what they are doing. Um, one example in, in Europe, and I know this is a very difficult discussion in many places, is coal. You know, we need to get uh, Europe to go a shift including away in from Germany, coal, including in Germany, you know, and there are lots of discussions on this, and there is absolutely <laughs> nobody that, that really can, um, in our process, object to let's shift uh, out of coal. Uh, so we welcome, for instance, the uh, initiative that was launched also uh, by the UK on uh, uh, phasing out of coal. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that's very important. We do see uh, this is a point, uh, a challenge for Poland, as was mentioned uh, before. And so yes, there, the transformation is going on, but it, it needs to be improved. Wonderful. Well, we don't get much positive British news on a stage in Brussels these days, so <laughs> thank you for that input. <laughs> If you're watching in Germany or across Europe, you've got some homework now from Patricia. Um, and thank you very much for, for joining us. And thank you to all of you thank for you, being part of this conversation. Thank you.
This is a cocktail event, so we've got some cocktails and some networking coming, and I think you might be joining us for a few minutes as well, yes, Patricia. Yeah, sure, sure. So please, everyone, come and join us outside, and thank you again to Gas Naturally for making the event possible. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Good. Good. It goes by very quickly, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You think it's it's uh, long, but then but yeah. no, it was good fun. Yeah, yeah like you. Name. The rapid questions. <laughs> they're always the most fun part. People are scared by it, but they're actually yes. Really fun. So. Yes. <laughs> oh please, sorry. Really?